Buenas tardes. Good afternoon. My name is Oscar Delgado, and in the next uh, 20, 25 minutes, I would like to talk about unit operation, industrial processes and diagrams, and why they are important for cybersecurity professionals. Who am I? I am a chemical engineer. I have been working in different industries, including oil and gas, mining, and water and wastewater treatment plants in the past 13 years. Most of my industrial experience is related with oil processing plants like refineries, central processing facilities, CPFs, and petrochemical plants. So most of the time I work either as process engineer or project engineer. So it means that I was involved in, with the design of the plant itself or with the integration of projects related with the plant. I like programming a lot, and since 2015 or so, I start diving into cybersecurity, including pen testing, blue and purple teaming, and nowadays ICS security. So, the plans for today's presentation is uh, to talk first about the importance of all of this. I want to give you some arguments about why you want to spend time studying processes. Then I will show one process to analyze by using unit operations. I will explain unit operations and the associated equipment. And finally, I will talk about a process diagram. Why is this important? Yeah, so why on earth do you want to know about unit operations or the process? You have several responsibilities, yet here I am asking you to understand the process. Why? The short answer is communication. So the management team and the operating team normally don't care about network, routers, historians, segmentation, etc. Sometimes they don't even care about threats or adversaries. They care about business and the products. So if you work for a water treatment plant, your operation team is focused on producing clean water. If you work in a refinery, they look the, on producing fuels, and that's it. And you should be able to understand the car business and talk with them and understanding what they are doing and how. So if you say uh, an attacker might modify the PLC logic, that sounds scary, but probably is not the worst fear. But if you tell them that A, B, or C equipment can be disabled by the attacker and therefore the production will be affected, I guarantee they will listen. So at this point, I would like to recommend a talk from Patrick Miller about executive communication and risk management. He provides a lot of strategies and tools to communicate with your management team, including, of course, knowing your business. And now that you don't need to know and understand the intrinsic details like, okay, the type of catalyst or the density of certain fluid, that's part of the process engineering job. That is not job. But should, you should be able to understand the whole picture. Unit operations is the concept I've used for this analysis, but you can look for other tools. At the end, the important goal is that you can describe what the plant does and how. The second answer to this question is to make better decisions. And I'm thinking here about priorities and risk assessment. I remember in the past a discussion I had about the risk of certain transmitters that have local diagnostics using web protocols. So indeed there was a risk, but the transmitter in question were used for monitoring an almost finished product. So from the operations point of view, any issue with those transmitters, regardless of why, was more a nuance than a risk, because they didn't affect the quality nor the actual inventory. So I agree, the operation team will need to go and verify other transmitters and maybe use manual tools while the situation is corrected, but it's not something that requires immediate action. We can say that a security professional who understands the process will have a better evaluation of risk, consequences, and priorities, and probably will have better strategies and better outcomes with talking with the operations and the management team. In the example that we will analyze, I will give you another case like this. I want to use as, an, as example the production of ammonia following the Haber-Bosch process. 
I would like to take a minute and look at, I would like you to take a minute and look at this diagram. This is a very, very simplified diagram. Yet, uh, I will argue that this is not trivial to understand. First of all, there are unit name that doesn't provide much information about the purpose. Second, there are some symbols without names and that make different difficult to understand like every single step in here. We see some vessels, some heat exchangers and the general material flow, but uh, I think it will be difficult for you to explain the process just with this information. And in the next slides, we are going to change that. Before we can start analyzing the process, we need to understand unit operations. We need to understand what are they and how they are used. So first of all, they are a concept. So, and this is very important because that means that they are sort of an agreement. They are a convention. So chemical engineers and process engineers decide to group operations based on similarities. And although it, it makes sense, it is completely arbitrary. Unit operations are just groups of operations with similar physical principles and common techniques. That's it. If they behave similar, they are in the same group. The, group, the number of groups is somehow disputed. I will show only four categories, but I have seen models with way more. And you know what? That's fine. Because the purpose is to understand a process by using build, these uh, building blocks. There is a phrase here that says that there are thousands of complex processes, but a few unit operations. Right now, I would like you to think about Lego blocks. You can take just some basic blocks and make thousands of different models. Same thing with unit operations. The only difference is that in industrial plant, each block can cost millions of dollars. And finally, in this slide, we have two keywords that you will find very often. Driving force and equilibrium. All processes want to reach equilibrium. Same pressure, same temperature, same concentration. This happens naturally. If you put hot water in your kitchen, you will not after a while it has the same temperature of the air. At the beginning, there was a difference or a driving force that promoted the change, but they reached thermal equilibrium and they stayed like that. We, as chemical engineers, normally profit from this and we create the conditions or the equipment to expedite the whole process. I will provide for each unit operation the driving force involved and I will give you some examples of the associated equipment. Just to help to understand the concept of unit operation, I would like to use a simple analogy with cooking. We know that there are thousands of different recipes. However, professional chefs can probably produce a successful one just by relying on their basic skills. Did they study every single recipe in the world? No. They look at basic techniques and master them. Then they integrate those basic techniques as required. Of course, they can go forward and study a type of cuisine and other details, but in general terms, I think we all agree that they use their basic techniques for a successful recipe. Process engineers do exactly the same. They use basic steps and they just integrate them in the different ways to make the unique product that is required. So you have here the list of unit operations, only four of them. I mentioned before that they are sort of a convention and therefore you might find some sources with six categories or eight categories, but at least for me, those are the basic ones. There are hundreds of thousands of processes, but I guarantee that you will find over and over similar equipment. And you can use that as an advantage for understanding each process. So instead of looking at the details and the specific of each process, try to look at the big pictures and their fundamental blocks. What about chemical reactions? Before you ask, let me tell you that chemical reactions are usually not considered as unit operation. They are very, very, very important, but they have some perks that needs to be addressed differently. So unit operation mostly deals with preparing raw materials and purifying products. In our example, all chemical reactions will be just another block.
So here we have the initial diagram for I replace all the reactors with those yellow blocks. I just provide a general description of what they do. So the first one is intended for hydrogen production and the second one is for the ammonia production. There are certain conditions required, for example, temperature, but for now we are going to continue our discussion without looking into those details. Finally, our first unit operation, fluid mechanics. This step involves the movement of fluids, which could be liquid, gas, or both simultaneously. When you open your tap to get water, there is fluid mechanics involved. There is a pipe, there is probably a pump somewhere along the way. The key concept here is movement, and the driving force is pressure difference. Pressure is normally the way that we identify this driving force. Um, for example, in propane tanks used for barbecue, there is liquid at high pressure, and when you allow to flow, you basically allow the pressurized fluid to push some fluid out. Another example could be a syringe. Um, this is an inter interesting one because it has the negative pressure of the vacuum that you use for the suction. And then we have the positive pressure that we, with our thumb that we use for the final displacement. I would like to know that every single industrial plant, regardless of the product, has at least a few pipelines and transport fluids from one place to another. They could be what we know as utilities. So for example, the water and the industrial air, or they can be actual materials, but they are present. So this step is very common in any industry. Equipment related with these steps, piping, pumps, and compressors. Back to our example. Here we see that all the blue lines are representing pipings. We also see a couple of compressors moving gas. And although it's not, the, it's not in the diagram, we probably have pumps for the liquid water and for the liquid ammonia transport. Our understanding of this process says that we are producing hydrogen and then we are moving gas through different steps from the left to the right until finally we have the ammonia. Not enough to explain the process, but we are getting there. The second unit operation is heat transfer, and I believe this is the easiest one to understand. We just put in this category an equipment that involves a temperature change either heating or cooling, or a phase change like condensation or evaporation. A little caveat here, sometimes there are specific names for the equipment based on what they do. So all of them are heat exchangers technically, but they are referred as revoiler or condenser or side condensers or things like that. The key to understand is uh, all of them involve a temperature change or a phase change, and the driving force is the temperature difference between two materials. In our diagram, we have three heat exchanger. So one is preheating the raw materials before they enter the reactor. The second one says energy recovery, and the last one is for condensing ammonia. So far, we know that this process involves moving raw materials, and at some specific points, we need to change the temperature of the reactants or their phase. Just a little bit of information. The ammonia reactions need a specific temperature, about 450C or 840F. So the first exchanger, the preheater, is used to bring the gas close to, to the reaction temperature. Now, after the ammonia reaction is completed, you still have hot gases coming out of the reactors and you don't want to lose that energy and money because you already pay for that. So what you do is to install a second heat exchanger and produce steam while cooling down some of those materials. Finally, you condensate the ammonia in the last heat exchanger to separate it from the gas reactor. I would like to make a comment about the second heat exchanger it makes totally sane to recover the energy from the hot gases. As I said, you already pay for that energy. So 
the next equipment, the condenser, is designed based on the output of this unit, right? Both of them are connected. However, I will say that depending on the configuration of the condenser, we might be able to send a, a different type of feed a little bit harder to the condenser and still recover some ammonia. Of course, it won't be optimal, but it might be possible. And in practical terms, it means that you might accept some issues in the energy recovery exchanger without stopping the whole production. And if you are the defender of this plan, I will argue that this information will help a lot when you are assigning priorities to your assets. So, if heat exchanger was the easy one, this is probably the most difficult to understand. Here we are dealing with processes that involve uh, moving selected components from one phase to another or within the same phase. The goal is normally to purify mixtures. I want to take some specific component because it can affect production or because it's dangerous. A common example, H2S. A small quantities like part per million can kill you in a few seconds, so normally you want it to remove it from the operation as soon as possible. The driving force here is concentration, chemical potential, so we want to move a some stream with high concentration to a stream with low concentration. Regarding the equipment, I will say that almost all towers or columns that you will see in a process, like the distillation columns or the absorption columns, are part of this group. As I said, this is probably the most difficult concept to understand, so I want to give you some day-to-day -day examples of mass transfer. You're probably familiar with these cases, but you don't use the, the term mass transfer. First, when we lit the candle or we, we cook something, we normally can smell the fragrance from, from a different room. So the, uh, the aromas are moving from high concentrated region to a less concentrated region. Same will happen if you put a few drops of dye in water or when you put sugar in your coffee, but it's, instead of stirring, you just wait. At the end, they all reach equilibrium. Uh, one interesting example is making sauce. When you are reducing a sauce, you are actually transferring water from the sauce, from the liquid phase, to the air. That's mass transfer as well. There is one particular unit here related with mass transfer and is the CO2 scrubber. What we need to do is to remove the CO2 before it entering the reactor, the ammonia reactor. So we use water to wash the gas stream. Basically, we are taking the CO2 from the gas phase and putting it into the water. That's all. Also notice that the resulting stream is soda water which is similar to the one that you drink at a restaurant. Solid operations, any team that involves solids is included here. Normally you are interested in size change and screening so that you can process the solids further. Typical equipment here are crushers, grinders and screens. They are not solid operations in our example, so we are just continuing. Okay, so we started here with this very simplified diagram, and we see a lot of units, some streams, some names, but I will argue this is not the diagram we want to use when explaining ammonia production to someone else. Then we use the concept of unit operation to understand what is going on and we ended here. We see that on the left side we have the raw material centering a reactor to produce hydrogen. We see that we produce CO2 as well. Uh, we want to send all those gases to another unit that removes CO2 by using water. The remaining gases, the reactants that we call, are heated before they enter the ammonia reactor. We produce ammonia and then we recover energy from the hot gases. 
Finally, we separate ammonia by condensation, sending the reactants back to the reactor. There are three zones in this diagram. First one is hydrogen production and purification. It encompasses everything until the green block. After that, we have the second zone, which is the ammonia production, and the final zone is the ammonia purification. I will argue at this point that even if the previous diagram was very simple, this one is way more accessible and easier to understand. And you know what? Other people thought the same. They even gave it a name. Block Flow Diagram or BFD. Block Flow Diagram is probably the first diagram that you develop as process engineer when you are designing or studying a new process. The idea is to use big blocks to show the important steps in the process. Know that all details are out. I don't need the type of heaters, I don't need the specifications. I just need to know that there is a temperature change or a phase change after or before certain step. The beauty of this is that the block for the heater in the ammonia process could be the same block used to represent a heater in a refinery or the same block to represent a heater in a water treatment plant. Our model says that all of them represent an operation involved in temperature change and that's all we, what we need. Again, the concept of Lego blocks. So those are your blocks. Those are the blocks that you want to use when you are studying or analyzing a process. Now, people in ICS ask a lot for PNIDs. Sometimes they ask for PFDs, but in my experience, they almost never ask for PFDs. And they are available most of the time. Even if, if they are not part of the engineering packages, I, I can say that they are normally flying around. BFD are the third type of diagram used by process engineers. And my advice is that you use them as well. They can help a lot to understand how things are connected in a complex process. There are a few things that I would like you to take from this talk. Number one, you should know your business. It might seem outside your job description, but it's really important that you understand what you are protecting. As ICS professional, you need to understand the physical part of it. Number two, complex processes can be simplified by using abstractions. And the same model can work for different processes. There are hundreds of thousands of processes, but I guarantee that you will find over and over similar equipment and you can use that advantage for understanding new process. So instead of looking at the details and specific, try to look at the essence and the fundamental blocks, the big picture. Number three, you're probably familiar with PFDs and PNIDs. They are very important, yes. They provide the detailed information about control loops and process variables, but I suggest that you look at the third diagram, the BFD. Is not very used nowadays, but it can help a lot for the understanding and the initial phases of approaching to a, a new process. Well, uh, thank you very much for your attention. If you have questions or you want to discuss some things, I will be available on the Discord channel. Uh, my name is Lihantropy. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much and cheers.